Warning, the following podcast contains violent scenes that may be unsettling to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Do you remember when vampires used to be scary? When one single vampire could just scare the shit out of you? I remember that. And we'll kind of delve into that in today's book we'll be talking about with the Brown Book Club, which is 1975's classic Salem's Lot. That was written by perhaps one of my favorite horror authors of all time, Stephen King. You know, it doesn't seem too like too long ago when the thought of a vampire used to scare me as a kid. You know, <clears throat> I think people, fans of the vampire genre can kind of be broken into two separate categories. Some might like the Anne Rice, Lestat, kind of romantic, gothic version of vampires, which I, I really have no issue with that. I'm a fan of Anne Rice's earlier works. But then you have the others that look at vampires like a scary intruder, single element that can just wreak havoc. And that's where I fell into becoming a fan of the vampire genre with movies such as like Fright Night, books such as Dracula and Salem's Lot, or just one vampire who slowly introduces himself into a human petri dish of sorts can scare the shit out of you. So today we'll be breaking down the three different ways that I feel that Stephen King's classic Salem's Lot can be used to inspire World of Darkness games. Not only just Vampire the Masquerade or Van- Vampire the Requiem, but other World of Darkness games too in ways that maybe some haven't thought of. But the first thing we're going to talk about is vampires and making vampires scary. So I think sometimes in Vampire the Masquerade, Vampire the Requiem games, like it's really easy to lose yourself in the fact that vampires are singular monsters. You know, we have in these games such elements as like uh, sex, such as the Camarilla, Camarilla, the Sabbat, Anarchs, whatever. Sometimes I think it's easy in having a city full of kindred or canines to lose the fact that these vampires are scary son of the guns on their own. One good thing that Salem Slot does is gives inspiration in a way to show how you can make one vampire scary. Now, I really try to do that in our Camarilla games and in our Sabat games that we run on our channel, but so it's really challenging. And so one thing that I've decided to do for the fourth Camarilla Twin Cities by Night story arc is make it a ghoul's fatal addiction game because I really want to kind of change the angle of perspective and focus and kind of show that these vampires are monsters and show it from a human perspective. And I think that one thing that Salem's Lot does very well is make the mystery of a single vampire from the perspective of mortals just scary as fuck, intimidating, looming, a presence. You know, this story does a real good job of really not having too many scenes with the vampire in question. Barlow is his name. But yet they have him be the most impactful character probably in the story where he has a group of people scared shitless. Like he's seen every move they make. He's he's predicting everything that they do. Is this him and one ghoul? Just one simple vampire and one simple ghoul retainer. That is wrecking havoc on a whole town. Reading this book, I was just like, oh man, I, this is such inspiration that can be used. And a lot of people maybe go, maybe like, hey, Chris, what the fuck are you talking about? How am I gonna make vampire scary in a vampire the masquerade game, right? Well, you can do that. I think you can do that with the fact that even with the difference between a neonate and an Ancilla or a neonate and an elder, just making that elder be distinctive, make it to where your brain can't really grasp its power, make it almost alien. You can even make a lone vampire or even someone they control scary. You know, one thing, something, by the way, that I didn't predict, but one thing that I have found in our Twin Seas by Night Camarilla game is the fact that a ghoul, a Duncern ghoul, has caused fear and panic in a group of kindred. This is all the perspective that you take. All It's the waves that you wish this figure, this person to create. And you add a little supernatural spin to it and you can do it and this book is really good at doing it. i plan to like take some things that i read from this book and perhaps utilize them in that ghoul's fatal addiction game that i'll be running in the future so what's the second thing that you could take away from this book 
it's an it's a way to handle infernalism. And let me kind of dive into this a little bit. So I find one of the most interesting concepts in the world of darkness is that of infernalism. I find that in a game lines, multiple game lines, where there's not a whack, a white and black scale, it's a gray scale on everything. To have something that is totally evil, pure in its evilness, to be something that's interesting to explore. But there's a caveat to that. Sometimes I think when it's been explored in different World of Darkness, different game line publications, that it probably hasn't been handled in the best way. For example, I am currently finally getting around to reading Montreal by Night. I've been excited for a couple of years to read this book. I just haven't gotten around to reading it. The main reason is because it has a reputation of being a black dog book, but also dealing with the subject of the Inquisition, Infernalism, and the Sabbat. But I'm not going to lie. Reading this book and reading the way that it handles Infernalism, I'm not really a fan of it. Why am I not a fan of it? Well, I feel that when you try to wrap definitions, concepts around something like Infernalism, with like human concepts, I guess, in a way, it takes away from the intimidation of it, from the from the, the, the horror of it. What do I mean by that? So spoilers ahead if you have not read Montreal by Night. But Montreal by Night, there is a demon that resides in a mountain in Montreal that has caused disease and pestilence for like 400 years, I think. It has influenced, has these like um, canines who haven't survived the burial rites that it controls and there's another demon from like haiti that's like warring with it and it just comes across so bad now no insult to the people writing it i'm not saying that i could have done better but what i'm saying is when you wrap concepts like names or wars with other demons and i don't know just shit like that it doesn't fucking make it scary you know, the thing about that I like about infernalism, and I don't like it, like infernalism, I'm talking about the concept in the game, is the fact that it is purely corruptible, purely evil, is the one true thing that you know is is a hundred percent wrong. And what I how I prefer to handle infernalism is not trying to put phrases, names, concepts, motivations behind darkness like that. One good thing that Salem's Lot does is there's a concept in the fact that evil attracts evilness. It's just like a battery, it pulls other evil things to it. And in this book, there's a concept of this house that resides in Salem's lot, that someone who used to live in it, who was probably an infernalist of some sorts, killed himself in it along with his wife. And the vampire antagonist of the book is drawn to that and has moved to the town because that house, he was a pen pal, I guess, corresponded with the moral owner, but never met him. And then in later short stories, Stephen King goes into the history of the town even more. But my point being is that there was... The only way that it was explained in the book was that it is a battery. A, resi a residue of evil lies there. And he does not try to take a stab at trying to give it human motivations, names, anything like that. Because you got to think about this. When it comes to concepts like infernalism or anything higher, religious or whatever, in these games or even in real life, we are finite beings, our minds. Are only capable of processing th certain things and there's no way for us to grasp the infinite meaning our minds cannot conceptualize some things such as in game infernalism the human mind should not be able to conceptualize something purely corruptible evil out there on a different reality different wavelength and that is what makes it scary that you can't negotiate with it that it can give you stuff but it will take what it wants from you that's unknown you can't name it you can't identify it it's there lurking destroying corrupting and that's one thing that i really and makes me drawn to like sabbat stories is the fact that they're fighting against infernalism but how can you identify it how can you know until it truly has already been identified that someone has been corrupted by it how can you prevent it it lingers so this book does a really good job of like subtly bringing up like infernalism, but not making it the forefront of the story. But it is an important critical role, but it's never really fully addressed. You just know that this battery of corruption is there and it draws evil to it. And that's a theme that Stephen King does, uses in his other books in the future. The fact that there are just some things that are evil that pulls other evil to it. That's it. Can't explain it. 
Our minds can't wrap around it. That's such thing as like in uh, Lovecraftian tales or games like Call of Cthulhu, where like you're you eventually go insane because when you when you, you witness so much. So that's the way I would prefer to handle infernalism in games, and that's what I'll take away from not saying if you handle it like how it was handled in Montreal by night or in other supplements. I'm not knocking you for that. You do you. <laughs> you know that's what the wonderful thing about these games. But I feel that the way that he handles it is he identifies it's there, but he doesn't make it the forefront. But it's there. It's there before the story, it's there during the story, and it's there after the story. Perfectly done, in my opinion. The third thing that you take away from it, and I've said this before in other books that I have talked about for the Brown Book Club, is this book does an awesome job in setting up the stage for the story to take place and meaning the small town talks about the character the 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 back i don't want to call it npcs because it's a book but like background characters their motivations the affairs they have the desires they have important figures in the city he's in, he even has like chapters where all he talks about is different people who live in the town and what they're doing in the town and how they are tied to the town and that i cannot stress enough will bring life into your games no matter what game no matter what line talking about anything from vampire the masquerade to hunter the visual to change the lost change the dreaming up, down, left, right, diagonal, any world darkness game that takes place in the city, I cannot stress enough, taking your time and coming up with realistic backdrop characters will bring life to your story that you would never foresee. And I learned this surprisingly, unexpectedly with uh, our Chronicles of Darkness game, World of Darkness game called The Ultimate Evil. I originally ran the game and just wanted to run it, a game that took place in a town I lived in as a child for a little bit and a time period that scared the shit out of me. You know, like when I came up with the game, I wasn't really thinking like, oh, I want these NPCs who are realistic people who have realistic goals. I found myself actually just creating NPCs that were based off people I knew as a child growing up there that I came across or whatever. And I found that in this game, originally, I was worried the players weren't having fun, you know, like I would have a you know, mortal character having a conversation with his mom about like taking care of herself. And I'm thinking to myself, man, he can't be enjoying this. And after the first session, he hit me up, Slavic, that was, and said he loved it. And I was blown away because I thought these guys were about to tell me they didn't want to play the game again. <laughs> and that game ended up having a lot of the vast majority of the scenes were just with real people, you know, quote unquote, real people, not supernaturally tied from a small town who had their own motivation, desires, dreams. And it added this like fucking layer and stories that, that is missing. I feel is missing a lot of World of Darkness stories. And that I try to utilize in our games. Am I perfect at it? No, probably not. But something that I'm always striving because I feel like you have to have that contrast of the supernatural element to make the supernatural element stand out. Kind of goes back to the first point where I was saying making vampires scary again. Well, if you just have every NBC be some kind of kindred or canine or whatever, it's not going to stand out. But this book, though, does a really good job. And it's not in-depth about these like backdrop characters, but it's enough to pull you in, to make you feel like you're connected to this town, that this town is part of the story. You know, if they just said, oh, there's a town, there's five people, a vampire shows up, they fight the vampire, they win, whatever, it's done. Eh, okay. But when you realize there's a town and there's a people that are getting corrupted by this vampire, who are losing their lives by this vampire, who are who are losing their town this town is is fundamentally becoming a ghost town it's more impactful when it feels like there's real people being affected by this and then it even draws the horror in more when real people are affected when real people are the victims so i definitely definitely suggest reading Stephen king salem's lot you can see in Stephen king salem's lot where games such as vampire the masquerade got some of their influence because i do think that salem's lot is a critical aspect of pop culture vampires i kind of took the concept of like a dracula what if dracula came to america kind of thing and it was done well so other than that if you would like to reach out to us you can find us on twitter at twin underscore cities underscore vtm or on facebook at twin cities by night you can find our discord in the description come and join us talk to us you can find our patreon link in there if you would like to help you can help for as low as a dollar that would help out a ton and mean a lot so we can upgrade our equipment bring a better quality product to you all. As always, thank you for listening, and I'll see you again until next time. Hello, folks. 
Have you ever wished you could have an easy way to find gameplay videos and podcasts, or just media in general that deals with your favorite White Wolf role-playing games? Or have you ever wished you could find a forum to share gameplay that you have recorded, one which wouldn't be drowned out by random posts and discussion so that your media could get the attention you want? Well, we have the answer for you in a Facebook group we run called White Wolf RPGs Gameplay and Media. The group is specifically ran with the sole intent of it being a one-stop shop for people to view or share media involving the games we all love. We take thorough steps to ensure the page does not become cluttered and is easy to traverse. We are currently over 1,000 members strong, and we are continuing to rapidly grow with new media being shared every day. Stop on by. We hope to see you there.